Good evening, everyone. My name is Katie Evans. I'm with Woodard & Kern, a consulting firm working for the town, and I'll be your moderator tonight. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for being here and for giving us your time. Um, I just saw that right now we're at about 50 people, and I really appreciate the turnout because, as you know, this is a really critical issue for Situate, and the new treatment plant is being built to address water quality issues. So it's critical that we have these discussions um, and address your concerns so that that project can move forward. So seeing you all show up this evening is really encouraging, and we appreciate your time and appreciate you being here. So we will um, pull up a presentation here and um, I'll talk us through our agenda. Um, so first of all, we're gonna have some opening remarks from Select Board Chair Anthony Vignani. Um, I believe he is on, we'll make sure. Um, but then we're gonna spend some time walking through the public outreach schedule and when you're gonna have opportunities to comment and continue to participate um, in comments and, and providing input to us. We also want to take some time tonight to address some of the most pressing questions we've heard. Um, we appreciate those of you who've sent comments and questions in via email or letter, those of you who've spoken up at town meetings and those who've come to our listening session. Um, we want to be able to address some of what we heard from you during those events. And then lastly, we're going to be showing you our most recent concept. It's only about a 15% design right now, but it does give us something to start having discussions about. Um, we want to show you how we've addressed some of your questions, and I'll say some, but not all. We still have work to do, um, and we are still working on it. But we want to show you what we've got right now to see if you think we're on the right track and, and hear of some of the um, actions we've taken in response to your comments um, are in the right direction. I do want to say before we get even to the end of the meeting that you're going to have multiple opportunities to comment. Um, we're going to post this concept on the website probably next week. So if you want to take some time to look at it and really digest it, you can always email your comments in and, and we are happy to receive them that way. But in addition to the concept that we're going to show you today, we're going to develop several more concepts throughout this process. So you're going to have a couple more opportunities for um, reviewing it and lots of bites at the apple, as we, as we say. Uh, and then at the end of the meeting, we will open up for public comment uh, and answer questions if we can. So uh, we'll work through that. Uh, we're scheduled for 90 minutes and I wanna be respectful of your time. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, do we have Tony? Great, okay. Then I will hand it over to Tony to um, start us off. Um, okay, so Tony looks like he's going to step away to another computer. Um, let's let's go ahead and give him a minute to do that. And while he does, we'll continue to talk through some of the other items on our agenda um, that can can be moved around a little bit. So let's talk a little bit about the schedule um, for the project and more specifically about um, public outreach and, and what's going on. So. To date, the engineering work that's been done um, so far has really been done to establish our treatment plant, plant process. So it's essentially the work we had to do to determine what the treatment plant will need to do and what it'll need to be capable of in order to address the water quality issues. So that's what you've seen us working on thus far. We haven't advanced any site-specific engineering design work yet. Um, besides the concept, of course, that you're going to see today. Um, and the reason for that is that we really need an approved site to do that. And I think that's important to note because it obviously puts us into a little bit of a chicken and egg situation. We can't complete the studies because we don't have an approved site, but at the same time, we know that you want to see the studies in order to approve the site. Um, so we're working through that and trying to um, do our best to be able to answer as many questions as we can. Um, the concept that you're going to see today is really um, more about sizing the critical components and arranging them on the site to show you, on the proposed site, I'm sorry, to show you how the pieces could potentially fit. Um, but it's not necessarily the site-specific engineering work that's going to be coming and, and is going to answer a lot of questions. So this is, it's important because it's important to note that, but it's also important to tell you that you're going to have additional opportunities if the site is approved. So we have this timeline and I apologize that it's hard to see. Um, you know, if you wanna review this further, I wanna be clear, this timeline is on our website. Uh, it's also posted with a detailed table that talks about all these different 
actions and how they work. So if you can't see it right now, I apologize about that, but it is available to you for you to reference if you'd like to. So uh, based on this timeline, I can show you we are here. We're in July. Um, hypothetically, if the if we get going on an approved site in September, we're going to start doing our field conditions assessment and treatment process. At the same time, the state, both the historical historical commission and the EPA, will be reviewing our work. And then, as we move through permitting, the Department of Transportation and the town, um, the various boards and commissions of the town, will also be continuing to review this work. Um, then you'll see the state DEP will do a review and before we build anything, the US EPA will be involved. And so those are important to point out because all of these um, opportunities that you're gonna see in red here, these are all opportunities where you'll have additional chances for public comment. So um, if there are specific items that you're concerned about, say environmental or light, those are all going to be reviewed during these processes as well. So that will provide some additional public comment time as well. So again, when I said you're gonna have multiple bites at the apple, I mean, you know, through this process and then going further as we go through permitting and review. Um, okay, so I'm gonna pause. I'm going to see if Tony can speak. He has, oh, he is rejoined. Let me just give him a chance to unmute. He's showing as muted on my end. Yeah, mine too. Um, that might be his old computer then. Okay. All right, oh. I will keep, oh. I think that he may be joining now. Apologize, we apologize everybody. Sometimes this is how things go with virtual meetings. I'm sure you've all been there. Okay, we can see you, Tony. Can you hear me? Yay, we can hear you. All right, great, thank you. All right, let me get undisheveled. Great, thank you, Katie. Um, I'm not sure where we are and stuff, but let me, uh, um, first of all, I just wanna start by thanking <clears throat> you know, everyone involved. I wanna thank all the citizens for coming and, and participating in this process. Um, all the consultants for working as hard they do. And, and I hope everybody knows that we're trying to move this progress along as, as quickly as possible, as effective as possible, as trans transparent as possible, and uh, really get the right plan in the right spot. Um, that being said, I think that it's very, very, very important that we get across how dire it is that we get this water treatment plant passed. Um, there are two very recent examples that I'd like to talk about for a second that really just described this perfectly. Um, just about two weeks ago, um, as many of the citizens know, we had to immediately put on a, a complete water restriction ban because the water, our current water treatment plants cleaning devices broke. And it was coming right before the 4th of July when our peak water is there and we were not gonna be able to run our water treatment plant at all. Um, and then, I, I believe the other cleaning tank broke also, and luckily we were able to fix it, but it just goes to show that that plant is really um, on its last legs. I know you've heard a hundred times that it's 60 or 70 years old. Um, the technology is old. There's no redundancy, um, and it's not able to do all the functionality that we want it to do. So again, I cannot emphasize enough that we are going to run into plant problems for the upcoming years until we get a new water treatment plant built. Um, on top of that, last night at our um, select board meeting, we allocated a $250,000 emergency fund for the water treatment plant because we're afraid that if something goes wrong, there will not be the funding available to fix it in time for us to call a special town meeting to get money available. So please understand that the treatment plant is um, you know, not doing what we need it to do and needs to be replaced as, quick, as quickly as possible. Um, the other example that I like to bring up that 
what many of the residents are aware of is recently we've had a big uptick in brown water. It happens every year along this time. Our water usage goes up. We're using a lot of water from the reservoir and the manganese is very, very high at the, at the reservoir this time of year. And our current water treatment plant does not clean manganese out of the water. Our new water treatment plant will. So another, you know, two of the biggest problems that we have in town are the brown water and, you know, our water restrictions and moving forward on this plant is necessary to fix both of those things. So, um, you know, I hope everyone understands that. I hope that you come back and understand um, the urgency of it and that any delay in it is really putting both of those things in jeopardy for, you know, you know, past the, past the level that we want to. Um, and please know that, you know, the, I know all of you are probably not as familiar with the municipal process. It does not go as quickly as you want. It's, it doesn't necessarily follow the path that you want, but it does move forward. And I do really appreciate the work that everyone's putting into it and the steps that we're making forward to, like I said, put the best plant in the best place, um, um, you know, under the best conditions. So I hope, I hope you hear that. I hope you go vote on the 19th and I hope you understand the urgency and vote in favor of the water treatment plant. And I'll be here to answer any questions if, if anything pops up. Okay, thanks, Tony. Um, okay, apologize about jumping around on the agenda a little bit, but we'll just move into um, providing some information about the um, information that we have been able to release to you so far prior to today's meeting. And, and I do want to be clear about um, your opportunity to continue to find information. Um, so we have a new website. Hopefully you've seen it. If you're on our email list, you um, probably have. Um, and I just want to encourage everyone to visit it. We'll go ahead and put a link in the chat right now um, so that you can get to it directly. And I would really encourage you to bookmark this page. We're going to continue to post information here. So as you can see right now, we have a frequently asked questions section that's done by topic. So if there's a specific item or issue that you're concerned about, you can likely find some information about that under the topics that are listed here. Um, we've also got the timeline that I just showed you. Um, the residuals management section has a really great video about lagoons and how they work and why they're necessary. So you can um, review that as well if that's something that you're interested in. We have this memo on traffic safety. And then the last thing is an interactive map, which allows you to hover over different parcels throughout town to see the pros and cons of putting um, the treatment plan on any of those sites. And, and it, it demonstrates you know, the importance of the site selection. So we encourage you to keep visiting that site and we're gonna keep sharing. And if you're on our email list, we'll keep sending out e-blasts to let you know when there's new information that's available. So um, just a little plug for the website, please do visit it. Um, okay, so next, you know, I really mentioned, I mentioned earlier that we really appreciate those of you who sent in questions and concerns, and we've got a couple that we know are really pressing. So we're gonna move into some of those questions. Um, one of the most prevalent one has been um, why the plant can't be located at the existing site where the existing treatment plant is. So at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Renee Lanza. Um, our project manager to talk through that question. Awesome, thanks Katie. So one of the big questions that we've received as we've been going through this process is, you know, why can't the existing site be used? Um, and to really start to answer that question, one of the things that we need to dive into that, that feels a little bit distant, I know for most people is residuals management. So one of the real key driving um, design criteria for this facility is process residuals for a couple of different reasons. So currently the old oak and bucket water treatment plant discharges the residuals to the sewer. So you don't see anything, there's a little bit of a pit, but um, it goes to the sewer. There's some issues with that with the new facility. Um, the new plant is gonna have the ability to treat more water than the existing plant during times of critical water demand. And additionally, it's gonna, produce a greater level of treatment. There are additional filtration processes um, and additional capacity that will increase that residuals production to about 100,000 gallons per day, which will be more than the existing facility. This is a challenge because as many of you may know, the town's existing sewer and wastewater treatment facility is really already at the top of its capacity. Um, it can't handle any additional new capacity for those residuals. 
So when looking at the existing site, that is one of the very key items and really what has pushed us into a lot of the site selection. You know, to be able to accommodate that, that would include significant wastewater treatment facility upgrades to be able to have capacity upgrades, which would require space um, and time and significant costs, as well as sewer infrastructure to be able to be upgraded to handle that additional. So the limitations on situate sewer capacity were really one of the driving factors that led to the discussion of lagoons and residuals management, um, which got us to a design decision to manage those residuals in an on-site lagoon system. One of the big things here is this would also look at a bigger picture of taking about 16 to 20 million gallons of water per year that's currently discharged to the sewer and taking that out. So next slide. So again, talking a little bit more about the the lagoons process. So when we talk about zero liquid discharge, which I know we've heard and, you know, admittedly, we haven't taken the time to really sit here and, and talk through it. And we're going to talk through it here. And again, as Katie mentioned, we did update um, the website with a video that goes into it a little bit more and really recommend checking that out to get a little bit more information on that. So through the treatment process, there are process residuals. So process residuals come off of different areas of the process, settled solids during clarification processes, as well as filter backwash. Um, those right now currently go to the sewer. In a lagoon system, what that would do is that would go to, as you can see in this middle, um, one of these lagoons. These lagoons have under drain systems and filtration built in. So the water would go from a treatment facility into these lagoons then percolates into the under drain system, which then results in two different products. As you can see on this far right, you end up having dry solids, which you can kind of see in that leftmost lagoon in that middle photo. And then you have clean lagoon filtrate. So you can see that that filtration through those under drain systems and, and the sand in that process really creates clean water. And that water is recycled back to the treatment facility, to the head of the facility to, to add to uh, the raw water because then we're being more sustainable and those dry solids are periodically hauled off site for disposal. So instead of sending that water to the sewer, being able to manage that on site gives a bit more flexibility for the town with timing of this project as well as site. You know, there are many areas in Situate that do not have sewer. So if we go to the next slide. So one of the big things to note is, you know, again, site constraints with those lagoon systems. So this right here is the existing Old Oak and Bucket site. So this outlined parcel right here is going, um, outlines that same photo right there. So that outlined parcel does include the baseball field and exactly, thank you, Rebecca, um, some of that tree over to the side. Highlighted in pink here are the critical facilities. So you have the existing facility uh, for the water treatment facility, as well as the raw water pump station, which is down a little bit more. Because of Situate's water um, limitations and the amount of water that the town needs, these cannot be taken offline. So any construction in any new facility needs to be built such that there's no interruption to these existing facilities to be able to continue to provide water. You know, right now the town can operate with maybe eight hours of this facility offline. We've talked about that. And that is a really critical component when looking at the future design here. So when we look at this I, space- I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to mention to everyone, we're seeing some questions in the chat and we will address those at the end. So if you'd like to go ahead and include um, your questions, that's fine. We'll address them after we complete the presentation. Sorry for the interruption. Okay. No worries. So if we take a look at the site again, and now we look at the components, um, just the facility in the lagoons that would be sized. So this is the facility and then the size of the lagoons that are currently sized based on the pilot that we have done per mass DEP requirements. So those size of those lagoons are, are large to be able to accommodate the residuals management that is needed for this additional treatment. And that is roughly the size of the water treatment facility building after working through some creating it a little bit smaller from our previous iterations and trying to find space. So what you'll see here is, you know, not even taking into consideration additional components such as parking, access roads, um, stormwater, just the treatment facility in these lagoons on this existing parcel really are impossible to fit with the existing facilities and maintaining them in operations. So just that alone is very challenging. You can't maintain that site access 
But additionally, there are some significant environmental constraints on this existing site as well. So if we take a look here at this next slide, a, a very significant portion of this existing site is within the flood zone. So that significantly impacts what buildable area is on this lot between these two parcels, both the existing parcel where the facility is currently, as well as the ball field parcel. And additionally, if we go the next step and take a look at wetlands, even more of that site outside of the floodplain is currently wetlands. So when you really look at the amount of space that you have there outside of wetlands, floodplain, as well as um, the size of these facilities and keeping those other facilities in operation, there really is no space. And we just want to really stress that is, you know, again, don't think we didn't look here. Um, you know, we did, but with this facility and, and the additional capacity um, that is needed for this facility, we really can't fit it on this existing parcel. So on that, and again, we'll get in more into those questions uh, as we do get into the Q&A portion, but I'm going to shift it over to Sean who's gonna talk a little bit about the operations at the site. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you for, uh, for attending tonight. My name is Sean Anderson, I'm the water superintendent, in case you don't know. Um, the water department works as a team of treatment, administration, administrative and distribution personnel. Every day there are numerous necessary interactions between all members of the different divisions within the department. These include review of previous day's work, staff updates, ongoing projects, critical needs for current day, service orders, dig safe requests, meter reads, water sampling, and plant performance needs and deliveries. And I kind of wanted to give you an example for what we dealt with um, just today, uh, today alone. We had a low pH alarm at well 17A first thing this morning. Um, we ran out of chemical at well 17A. That's what caused the, um, the low pH alarm. And that's due to an ongoing supply chain issue. Um, we actually had a chemical delivery truck waiting for us this morning. And uh, that fills us back up again. We had a water main break caused by a contractor hitting the line with his machine. Um, we had lower than normal storage tank levels. We had a, a treatment plant power failure and subsequent running of, um, on generator power. And that generator, it automatically transfers in the event of a power failure, but it will not transfer automatically back to the grid. Um, due to arc flash uh, protection, um, OSHA safety laws, we're not allowed to transfer it back. I don't know if you ever saw the first Jurassic Park movie where somebody has to pump up in order to reset the uh, electrical service. That's basically what has to be done at our plant. So um, that's, that's basically what we're working with there. Um, we fixed the treatment plant electricity, got that back up and running. A backflow device was leaking at the treatment plant and needed fixing by a plumber. We had discolored water calls all throughout town um, because of the above issues that I just spoke about. We had dig safe, work orders we had to take care of. Uh, a small crew of three did a service leak repair. We had meter reading and logging to do, water sampling, and numerous other things. Um, there's many moving parts uh, trying to want, run a water department. And all of this was able to be successfully completed because of the different divisions of the water department are currently housed together and work as a team. Separating any of the team, whether it be distribution, administration, or treatment, would massively, would be a massively inefficient and detrimental to our daily work. The current setup and proximity allow quick access to all needs, including, but not limited to, inventory, communication, and input from various resources on top of our daily services. Um, to put it in another way um, that uh, Steve uh, Rafferty said, if your wife lived in one house, you in another, and your kids in a third location, it would be difficult to communicate and work as a family. So that's just a, another way to look at it. Um, 
thank you again uh, for your time. And I am going to pass this along to Rob Little. All right. Thank you, Sean. And I appreciate all the residents for being on and uh, being so honest and thoughtful with your questions. Um, I'm going to, uh, my name is Rob Little. I'm the National Practice Leader for Drinking Water at Woodard and Curran. Um, and I'm going to uh, do my best to address some of the abutter concerns uh, about our impacts that we've talked about uh, in the listening session and we've received through email. So next slide, please. Um, the first one of those concerns is noise. And I can certainly understand why folks would be concerned about noise. Um, there's you know, four bullet items there that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, you know, potential uh, noise activities that are going to be occurring at the site. Um, that you might be concerned with operations and maintenance activities, um, you know, for example. But generally speaking, water treatment plants are very quiet. We have some data that we're going to show you um, in a minute about some ambient readings that we took around some existing treatment plants. But I, I don't want people to get the sense that this is, you know, a very, very noisy facility. Um, we have, uh, uh, as the first bullet there shows, operations and maintenance act activities. That's normally just, you know, uh, Sean and his staff, you know, coming and going from the facility at the beginning end of shifts, you know, some vehicular traffic, uh, mostly routine vehicular traffic uh, of the staff and then as well as the public, you know, coming in to do their business you know, with the water department. Um, we will have periodic truck deliveries and we'll show you a site plan in a minute that shows, you know, how we sort of routed the trucks um, around the back of the site. Uh, and then generator, generator exercise, excuse me. Um, that's uh, a necessary activity. Sean mentioned that there was a power failure. Those things do happen. Um, having generator power is critical to the operation of the facility um, and to ensure that the generator comes on when it needs to, um, those need to be exercised on a relatively uh, routine basis. Uh, but that's generally once a week during daytime hours. All of these activities that I have listed there are during daytime hours. I wanted to make that an important point. Um, you know, and we're looking at ways to, to mitigate that noise even from the generator exercising generally 15 to 30 minutes per week again during the day. Uh, the graphic at the bottom there shows uh, decibel level readings of, of, you know, a number of different, you know, you know, sounds that you may be familiar with. You know, we took uh, decibel readings around three different plants that we are familiar with existing water treatment plants at various distances. Uh, away from the plant itself. And these were, you know, with the door closed during normal operations. And you see, you know, generally speaking, the noise levels aren't any louder than a conversation. That's right outside the treatment plant, you know, zero feet away. As you get further away, obviously the noise level decreases um, down to at 100 feet. You know, it's really, you know, birds, bird calls. Um, important to note that the, there's ambient sounds going on at these treatment plants, just like there is at the Stearns Meadow site. So, um, you know, very, very quiet activities. Of course, there are going to be periods of time, you know, when uh, when noise levels exceed those. However, those will be very limited. You know, during construction, there are some things that we can do to, you know, mitigate construction noise, uh, temporary fences, limiting of hours, and we'll certainly work with the town to establish, you know, what those working hours would be. You know, and then, you know, once the you know facility is in operation, you know, I mentioned a few things like generator exercising that those noise levels will exceed those sort of baseline levels but those will be very brief and intermittent. There's not a lot of maintenance activity that's going on in the vehicle yards here at this site. Uh, next slide, please. So lighting considerations I know have been brought up in the past uh, um, and there's you know, a number of items I plan to touch on in the next minute or so. Uh, safety and security lighting is obviously critical. Um, exterior lighting will be necessary. I, I wanna be clear that there will be exterior lighting on this facility but primarily for security purposes. You know, we do want all town staff and uh, public and vendors visiting the facility, uh, even in the wintertime late in the afternoon uh, to be safe. Um, you know, safety is of course the primary concern. Uh, lighting can also help prevent vandalism and unauthorized access, but you know, there's again, some mitigating factors that we can take uh, uh, to sort of minimize the impact of the butters. Um, access, you know, lighting is gonna be critical. Um, you know, we want to illuminate the public access areas again for the wintertime months where it gets dark a little earlier. Um, we'll be providing exterior lighting to ensure that the walkways are safe and so forth. You know, as mitigating factors, we'll work, you know, very hard to establish, you know, the largest possible tree and land buffer areas. Um, we'll use directional lighting, you know, lighting angled down designed specifically to illuminate a certain area and not broadcast the, the, the light um, where it doesn't need to go. Um, and then hours of operation. The, the vast majority of the, the work that's gonna be performed at this treatment plant, both with the, the town staff who operate the facility and maintain it, as well as the public visiting the department, 
will be during the day. So there's not a lot of need for exterior light aside from the, the minimal safety and security you know, purposes that I mentioned before. Uh, the last thing I'll, note, I'll make mention of is the note at the bottom. Uh, the lighting plans will certainly be reviewed and approved, they'll have uh, approval authority uh, with the Town of Situates Planning Board. So as Katie mentioned earlier, this is not um, everyone's last bite at the apple to talk about lighting. All of our you know, future plans, both lighting and others, will have to be approved by the various town boards as we move through the design process. Um, so privacy considerations. And again, in a few slides, I'll show a design concept. We're very early in the design, but we've done our best to listen to a lot of your concerns and try and maximize the, uh, the tree buffer to the, to the highest extent possible. You know, the natural tree uh, buffer that exists there now, as well as you know, replanting, uh, maybe providing some additional plantings. We have some rows of arborvitae, arborvitae shown there. Uh, very effective way to screen, um, you know, provide privacy screening for you know abutting properties. Um, privacy fencing is another thing that we could consider uh, including into the design. Um, and then again, I want to I want to bring it up: hours of operation. So there's not going to be a lot of nighttime activity at the site. So if, if uh, folks are concerned with you know, a lot of a lot of people being around the facility, you know, late into the evening, you know, that's simply not the way the, the water department works. And then lastly, you know, just touch up, touch on a few random things, you know, Renee, uh, you know, handled the residuals um, area quite well. Um, I've heard concerns about, you know, percolation of that water into the ground. Um, that is actually, you know, not the way it's designed. There's an under drain system, as Renee, Renee mentioned, that will pull the, excuse me, <clears throat> the water out of the bottom side of the lagoons to help in drying, help make it more efficient, and make it more water efficient as we re recycle that clean filtrate to the head of the plant. So there's no impact to the uh, existing groundwater. Um, there will also be no additional land use restrictions um, for abutting property. Nothing changes um, with the construction of this plant at that site for the abutting properties. Uh, uh, no changes there. With regard to traffic safety, um, obviously during the design we'll work to establish safe sight lines, um, make sure that visibility is appropriate, uh, uh, install appropriate turning distances, and we're also going to be working closely with the planning board and mass DOT on that as we move through the design. You know, there are some studies that are going to be done, clearly we'll be incorporating the results of those studies into our, into our final design package. You know, and then lastly, uh, stormwater management. Um, on the far right hand side of that photo there, that's again an aerial of uh, University of New Hampshire uh, in Durham, uh, their new treatment facility, you know, similar lagoon setup. There's three there, you know, we're proposing two, um, but you'll see the, the pond over to the right, stormwater. Um, the site design will include stormwater detention ponds. Um, the town of Situate has very strict stormwater requirements, even stricter than state requirements. And of course we'll be abiding by all of those those requirements as we you know, work to limit the runoff uh, off of the site. So uh, I wanna move forward to uh, the site layout. Um, yeah, one more slide, please. So um, I believe this was shared, hopefully you've all seen it. Um, uh, we had uh, at first, you know, at first cut, I'll say uh, a two building design proposed. Um, you know, we had the you know, sort of office admin area closer to the built, uh, closer to the street. Um, along with the garage and then the treatment plant was sort of at the back of the site. Um, you know, we, we absolutely listened to your concerns um, and developed a, you know, a different site. You can move forward one slide, please. Um, and that's what, you know, I want to kind of speak to at this point. So um, what I'd like to do is sort of walk you through the various elements of the site plan, you know, from right to left. I don't know, Rebecca, do you have the ability to point, you know, with your, with your cursor as we're going through this? If I'll follow along with my cursor. You should okay, be able to see it. You. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. So um, moving from right to left, you know, we have the, um, the vehicular access for the, uh, the public um, moving into this little parking area in the front of the building to come pay their bills and do other business with the water department. Um, moving up the driveway, you know, we have access to some uh, vehicular bays. Um, there's uh, covered, covered equipment storage, covered vehicular storage there. Um, the, the town invests an awful lot of money in the equipment that the water department needs to operate. And it's, you know, I think critical to have interior storage for, for those vehicles and other equipment. Uh, so the, the lifespan of that equipment will be you know, significantly increased. Off to the upper right of that, there, you'll see a little, uh, the little black line and the little offshoot. 
Um, there's a historic site there that the planning board had has asked us to preserve access to. So the current site plan incorporates that, you know, a pedestrian access to that, you know, to that historic site. Um, the two uh, bays with little arrows on them uh, at the top there, those are drive through bays. Uh, for safety purposes, a lot of the, uh, or some, I should say, of the water department's equipment does require drive through bays, you know, to limit, you know, backing up uh, and uh, with the, the some of the larger trailers and other equipment. Um, the building area just to the left of that is the operations and administration area. And Sean spoke about, you know, the reasons why you know, we feel it's critical to have, you know, the uh, operations, uh, you know, billing and administration staff right with the treatment folks because they do operate as one team. Uh, to the left of that, we have um, the actual treatment process area or the majority of it anyway. Um, we've done our best to incorporate that, that building into the topography of the site. Uh, as you're aware, the, the site slopes downward from right to left, which is north to south, if you're looking at this, you know, the plan with, with the north arrow there. Um, so we've limited the height of the building by you know, designing it such that water will enter at the right hand side or north end of the plant and sort of use gravity to flow down through the plant, which eliminates you know, some costly repumping and really just makes the, makes the process much more efficient. Um, with regard to traffic flow, again, uh, you know, uh, public access will be through the right hand uh, entry, entryway. Uh, the truck traffic, which again is periodic deliveries of chemicals and so forth to make the treatment plant um, operate, uh, will come around the back. Um, that's difficult to turn those vehicles around, so we've provided a second means of egress there, uh, you know, back out onto, uh, onto 3A. Um, stormwater basins, those two blue rectangles there are the stormwater basins, you know, one design concept for them uh, to capture runoff from the site and really limit runoff to what it is during, you know, pre-existing conditions. Um, and then lastly, the residuals lagoons, those are uh, those long rectangles of the uh, lagoon system that Renee spoke about before. And again, for, you know, we had, we did create a video on how those operate. Uh, it's fairly, you know, technical. Um, but if you check out that video, I think you'll get a good sense of, uh, of what their purpose is. You know, the, it, if water was to go to a sewer, even at the uh, Old Oak and Bucket plant, uh, we're creating an increased amount of residuals, which require additional on-site tankage, you know, some other large structures to handle that prior to pumping to the sewer. So it's really, you know, not the most efficient way uh, to work. And, and you'll see the lagoon system there. Um, this site plan that you're looking at now, really we've worked to try and maximize the uh, existing tree buffer. The site clearing on this site uh, is roughly seven to eight acres, the way it's being presented on this concept level plan um, of the approximately 15 acre site. So it's a significant reduction from the two building option that we had uh, presented on a, on a prior you know, concept layout. Um, the, we've increased the tree buffer in the, in the, uh, on the route 3A side of the structure. Um, really to limit the view from the street to those, you know, the two access points, you know, and then mostly focusing on the rear of the site, the west side, where, you know, prior version had a uh, buffer zone of approximately 30 feet. The minimum here is 50. And then as you can see, the treed area, we've just shown a few trees there, but that entire area would be, you know, would be, you know, forested um, up to about a 200 foot buffer zone uh, tree buffer from the, the west side of the property. So with that, um, I want to remind everybody that you know these are preliminary plans. We are doing you know everything we can, working with you know the site civil design folks to make sure that the stormwater will work, the residuals lagoons will work, and the topography works. If this building can be moved to even further optimize those those you know the west side primarily and and other setbacks and buffer zones, we'll certainly do that. And our plan is to post this. So we, we're checking on a few things right now, but our plan is to post this up to the uh, the project site webpage uh, as soon as we can. So, and again, uh, lastly, there, there will be many other opportunities for public comment on this. This is just a concept level design. So, you know, folks will be seeing, you know, we encourage you to take a look at this plan, you know, make your comments, and then there'll be, will be other approval processes through other, other town uh, boards and entities as we move forward. Great. Thank you, Rob. So um, the next thing on our agenda is our open comment and discussion, but I think I'm just going to pause and try to address some of the questions that have been asked in the chat. 
Um, a few of the questions, a lot of the questions go together. So I'm gonna do my best here to try to consolidate them so that we can get some answers to a few of these before we get into open comment. So um, Renee, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn to you here for some questions that are specific to the lagoons. Um, there have been several questions here about whether the lagoons could be placed at the old facility while um, the treatment plant was placed at the new lo location. Um, and then, you know, if that's possible, what would that look like? Um, additionally, there's a question here about, um, you know, what happens if there are no lagoons? And I think you started to talk about that, but maybe you could go a little more detailed about what the impact to the wastewater system that that would have. Yep, and I do want to address, I know I saw a couple comments in there, uh, these concepts both on this and on the um, schematic of the existing site are the reduced sized lagoons. So these do incorporate the lagoons. Um, as far as the first question, which was, remind me one more time. And they be on the old site. So one of the challenges, if you have those on the old site and the facility here is there's significant hydraulic links between the facility and the lagoons. So if you end up putting uh, the lagoons at the existing site and having the treatment facility at this site, there's a couple operational challenges there, but, but big, you have hydraulic challenges is you have to get water from the lagoons back to the treatment facility if you are doing that liquid, zero liquid discharge, as well as getting those solids um, down to the lagoon. So you're talking in addition to a raw water main that would be in the street, you're also adding two additional um, pipes in there. So there's the big challenge there would be hydraulics um, and really functionally um, the challenge there. And I'm not sure that Mass EP would allow it to be at a separate site. Sorry, my motion sensor <laughs> in my office. Um, so that's that one. As far as on the existing site, could you have the existing site without the lagoons, I believe was the question. And it really comes down to uh, the capacity is we can't include, um, and we can go back to, Rebecca, do you wanna go to the, one that shows um, the look, yeah, perfect. Um, oh, no, go back. One that shows both the lagoons in there. So even if you took um, those lagoons away, and, and I saw another question that talked about building the new facility and then adding the lagoons after. Again, you know, if you look here, even if you took the lagoons away and you had the existing facility, which again, you know, the challenge there is we would not be able to operate with the current sewer capacity that we have without the lagoons, without having those upgrades at the wastewater treatment facility is you can't fit that facility on, you know, buildable area within this flood zone. And then if you go to the next slide on that wetlands, you have very, very limited buildable area that is not that is outside of where the existing treatment facility is that can't be um, interrupted for service as well as um, to be able to construct that new facility. Plus, in addition to that, we don't have the sewer capacity. So at this existing site, you really can't do it. Um, one, you can't fit the lagoons and maintain operations and you can't do the facility without the lagoons because we don't have the wastewater capacity. Thanks, Renee. Um, two more questions that maybe if you don't have the answer, these might be things we can consider for possible future considerations. Um, do the lagoons need to be side by side? Can they be rotated um, on the site so that they're further from the homes? And then is it possible for lagoons or does it work for the lagoons to be covered? As far as the rotation, uh, we will have to double check on the hydraulics. I wanna say that the reason they are side to side is because of the topography of this site is pretty significant here. Um, that slope from down, which works in the instance of these lagoons because we do want them to be downhill, that treatment facility to be able to be more efficient with operations on energy. However, if you put them up and down with the topography of the site, and again, this is very site specific, um, it would be a very significant challenge to be able to make the earthwork. You would 
be doing some pretty significant impoundment of the water to be able to make that work. Um, we'll definitely look at it, but uh, this graphic doesn't show how significant the topography difference is from north to south of this site. As far as covering, um, that can be a discussion. Um, we can definitely look into that. That would be having significant cost implications. And I do know that there are not that. And I'll kind of ask Rob, I don't think I yeah. know any. <laughs> no, general, uh, thank you, Renee. Uh, generally, you don't see them covered. There's two reasons for that. One is, you know, during the summer, the warmer months, we like to take advantage of the, okay. you know, the sun beating down on them and to help dry out the material. That makes it uh, more cost effective to remove at the end of the day. Um, the, you know, rainwater that gets in, that may be a question you have. They, we have a, a, a type of gate structure, um, an overflow, if you will, where we can drain that, that rainwater off. So we take as much advantage of the you know, the natural drying as we can. On the flip side of that, uh, there's a, a process called freeze thaw. Uh, and in New England uh, region, we have an advantage that a lot of regions in the South don't have, which is, you know, we have cold weather. Um, maybe not be an advantage in many cases, but it is here because it will freeze the top layer of this residuals material. And then in the summer months or in the warmer months when it thaws, that uh, it's basically squeezed all of the moisture out of that material, which can be recycled and you know, even further dries it to make it less costly for the town to dispose of it in the, at the end of the day. And I do wanna address just because I think this will go with all the comments for I think Janie, um, as far as Chief Justice Cushing Highway is at the bottom of the page here. So that straight line at the bottom is Chief Justice Cushing Highway 3A. And so this site is to the left on 3A right after you drive over the reservoir and tack factory pond. So for those of you that are a little less familiar with kind of this to date, that is where the site is that we are talking about. So uh, over to the left is where um, the tack factory pond is. Yeah, and you know, um, Rob was really segueing into another question we've got here, uh, two questions. The first one is, um, is, is this material, I guess, is this, you know, residual water considered wastewater or stormwater? But secondly, we have a question here that's um, really kind of where you were going with what management and maintenance challenges would this proposed site have during high rain events um, with resultant runoff and primary intake water. So I, I think that's, um, you know, you talked a little bit about the stormwater portion of the facility. Maybe you can go more into uh, the stormwater wastewater question and then also uh, the preparations that are being put into place for weather events. Sure, I can, I can handle that one and then Renee can chime in if she chooses. So um, to separate the wastewater, because there will be sanitary facilities in this, uh, in this facility, uh, bathrooms and so forth, there is a, there's a septic tank, uh, a leaching field. And that's the area that's shown over to the far right or northern end. So that's, you know, it's a grassy field at the end of the day. You know, most people I'm sure are familiar with what they look like. It's just open meadow. Um, so that's where the sanitary waste from the facility will go. Uh, stormwater runoff during rain events, um, I'll talk about it two ways. During construction, um, as with any major construction project, there's significant runoff considerations given to any, you know, any construction project in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. There's very specific measures that you need to take to protect abutters, to protect uh, nearby waterways. So during construction, certainly appropriate measures will be taken to protect, you know, all of the, you know, the abutters and the and the uh, and the tech factory pond. The runoff that comes from the building from the site you know following construction for you know many years to come will be handled in those stormwater detention ponds so the majority of the uh, the way it works is the those ponds will hold the vast majority of the runoff from the site so it can again percolate into the ground um, and we try to limit the amount of runoff onto adjacent properties to at or below existing conditions so there's a very specific very prescriptive design process that we use looking at you know, roofing area, impervious materials, pervious, pervious areas, um, and the, the detention ponds will be designed, you know, in accordance with best management practices for handling of stormwater in the state. Um, the uh, lastly, the filtrate, which is the water that comes down through the residuals lagoons and gets, you know, filtered and then ultimately recycled to the, the head or the beginning of the treatment process, you know, that is not considered wastewater. That's you know, a processed waste that is then appropriately treated and goes back in as raw water, um, generally cleaner than what you might see from the pond because it's had some filtration already, but that improves the water efficiency of the pond. So no, it's not classified as wastewater. 
I think I touched on all those points, Katie. Yeah, thank you. I think that that um, does clarify some of these things. Um, we have a few things in here that I will note are comments. So if you've made a comment that's not a question, we'll certainly take note of that um, in continuing to uh, refine our design. So thank you for those comments. Um, I do think that we want to probably, well, let me, let me ask if we can address this question. We are getting some questions about you know, how impactful this will be as far as improving water quality. So one question is, will this new plant remove the need for home filtration systems? You know, how do we see this plant as really improving the groundwater situation and the Magni situation? Um, and, you know, will this help with the distribution system? So can we talk a little bit about the impact that the new plant can have on the water quality issues? I can take that one too, and then maybe turn it over to the town. So um, this plan is one piece of it, and I, uh, it's a critical part. Um, the manganese that's in the distribution system right now has come from years and years of operating the old plant, which we talked about is not capable of, uh, you know, of removing it. So it's built up over time. The town's, you know, uh, invested quite a bit in cleaning up some of the pipes, but there's still more work to be done. But it, the chat, it really starts. The solution starts at the treatment plant, getting the manganese out of the water through the treatment process and putting out clean water, you know, with, you know, zero to non or non detect very, very low levels of manganese is cr a critical part of the solution. Maybe, sh you know, Sean can talk a little bit more about the town's other plans. Sure. Yes. Um, it, re removing the manganese at the plant is, um, for me, it, it's a bit primary concern right now. Um, every summer, it's just been a repeat cycle. The water warms up in Old Oaken Bucket, the manganese rises. And I think there was a question there about why there was manganese um, in, the, in the, the surface water. Uh, part of the reason there's manganese in the surface water is for many, many years, one of our wells, well 17A, instead of filtering it the way we do now with the green sand filter plant, they pumped it over to Old Oaken Bucket Pond um, to provide additional water supply. Um, and that water is filled with manganese, 7.7 um, um, milligrams per liter. And so for many, many years, they pumped that water into that pond. And now we're um, suffering from the consequences um, of doing that. So being able to remove the manganese um, is, is going to be extraordinary. The, the second step after this plant is built is um, continuing with our flushing program. The manganese, unfortunately, every summer, the plant puts out manganese, it accumulates out in the system. Disruptions like the water main break today make it so that the entire town gets basically shook up or turns into a snow globe. Um, flushing will get that out, especially spring and fall. But as long as our existing plant continues to pump it out during the summer, it's going to be an issue uh, seasonally until we can get a new facility online. Uh, we have done a lot of uh, some great improvements on the older water mains. We're going to continue water mains. Um, we've had uh, great support with doing $2 million uh, a year worth of water main replacement. And uh, we're being very methodical about, methodical about where, which mains we do. Um, we're targeting the, the oldest mains um, first, but we're all, all also looking at sewer infrastructure and uh, the conditions of the roads and drainage. Um, so it's a, it's a multi-tiered, um, process. Yeah. So we actually have some questions that, that, um, kind of go with what you're talking about here. We just received a question asking, you know, what this project's role is in the larger plans, um, to phase in additional sewer utility, but we got some additional questions, um, specifically about where we are on the demand curve. And if this is an expandable design, so maybe we can talk about this plant, the, the capacity that this plant has been designed for. Yes, yeah, so the capacity, this will be a three MGD plant, um, which our existing plant is supposed to be a three MGD plant. However, we cannot get anywhere near that through the plant. Um, maximum on, on, on a best day, it would, it would have to be one point seven maybe million gallons a day, 1.8 um, on a stretch. Um, this facility will be able to do the 3 million gallons a day. Um, so that will be extraordinary in terms of 
being able to having the option of running a surface water treatment plant and resting our our drinking water wells, um, particularly off season, so that we have more of the well water in the summertime. Um, currently, the surface water treatment plant is about 32% of the total um, demand in the system. Okay. Thank you. And I think, um, Marianne, I'm not sure if that addresses your question too about the increased population. Um, if, if not, let me know, please. Um, okay. Um, we do have some other sort of interesting questions in here on things we haven't explored um, to date, like using solar panels on the facility. So thanks for those. We'll continue to work through um, that information. Um, I think at this point, we should probably move into our open comment and discussion. So we do have time to allow people to, um, to have those discussions with us. If you want to continue to put questions in the chat, please feel free to do that. And we can um, either respond to you in the chat as we're discussing, or um, we can get a hold of you with some more detailed information following this meeting. So, um, and again, you know, we do, we do know that we're going to have multiple rounds of these discussions, so we will continue this, um, you know, answering these questions and addressing these needs. And, you know, if we don't address everything today, please, please stay with us. Please continue to check in. We're going to keep at this. So let's go ahead and move into our open comment section. So um, we want to do our best to make sure that everyone is able to speak. Um, you are currently muted. What we'll do is we will call on you, um, we'll unmute you and allow you to speak. We're going to ask that you please state your name and address. And we're really gonna ask that you limit yourself to three minutes because we do wanna let everyone have an opportunity um, to speak today. Uh, for those of you who attended the listening session, you'll remember this, but because I can't see all of your heads nodding <laughs> and because we do wanna try and minimize repetition, if someone says something that you agree with, or you were going to say as well, um, you can put plus one in the chat, the plus sign, and then the one. And we can take note of that as something that a lot of people support or um, something that other people wanted to say. You're also welcome to send me private messages in the chat. If you want to share something with me without sharing it with the full group, I can, I can note those things down as well. Um, and then as a last reminder, and, and we'll go to the last slide so that the information is available to you, but you're also welcome to submit comments to us anytime via email. So if you would like to have more time with this design, and I did see a comment in the chat that you would have liked to have had um, more time with this, we will post it to the website and we are happy to receive your comments anytime. It does not have to be tonight. You're not limited to tonight. Um, so, okay. So with that, um, I think we'll get this process going. So if you would like to make a comment, please raise your hand. Um, I'm not seeing raised hands. <laughs> Rebecca, are you seeing raised hands? Nope, I am not. Okay, we might have a complication here. Um, okay, let's do this. Um, nope, I just I just saw one. I think it's there we starting go. to work. Yep. Okay. Um, so uh, Freya, you will be first. I will unmute you now. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, I just wanted to ask. Um, sorry, Freya Schlegel, Nine Westgate Lane. I wanted to ask what happens if this vote does not pass at the location? Is there a backup plan? What would the delay um, on the timeline and cost be? Has that even been explored yet? Yeah, so, I mean, you're right. What would happen if, um, if the site is not approved um, is that we'll move into sort of a a new phase of feasibility assessment in attempting to find a location. The town does need this plant. And so um, what would happen is if, if this did not get approved, it would, kind of, it would move us back into determining the feasibility of sites. Um, does someone want to speak more specifically on what that would entail? Um, let me throw that over to maybe Sean. If yeah, you're... Property raised his 
physical oh. hand. Okay. I'm sorry, who raised their physical hand? Stephen Rafferty. Oh, Stephen, I'm sorry, Stephen, I can't see you. Rebecca, could you please unmute Stephen? So we've done a lot of conversation about what it would mean if we stayed at the existing site. The path at the existing site will take a lot longer because we would need to find 7% more capacity at the wastewater treatment plant because we'd have no place to put the lagoons. So, you know, plan B here is not a good plan because it adds years and years to the project schedule because you have to first go do facility planning work for the wastewater plant, get permission to increase the capacity at the wastewater plant and have that available to you before you build a new water treatment plant. That's a very lengthy process and um, not something I think anybody who's been working on this project for the last year and a half would look forward to having to do. Okay. Um, so I see here we have a question about other sites and, and why haven't we looked at them. I, I would encourage you all to go visit the interactive map that we posted to the website. If you go there, you can um, hover over a variety of different sites and um, get a sense of you know, what some of the considerations of those sites were. So thank you for that question and, and thanks for that um, response. All right, um, it looks like next we have Marion Finn. So Marion, I'll ask you to unmute now. Thank you, uh, Marion Finn, Lawson Road. I just had a question in response to that most recent comment about visiting sites and revisiting. What is the time plan for the current site if it were to pass? And then you're saying a lengthy period of time. What is your guesstimate if we have to look at other sites and go to another uh, vote, et cetera? Your, your estimate, of course. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Marianne. So I'll talk about our existing timeline and then I'll give it back to Stephen again to talk about what the guesstimate would be because he knows better than I do. But as you can see on the timeline that we showed earlier, we're here. Um, if the town were to approve the site at the September 19th special town meeting, we'd begin all of this field work, the design and the planning. We'd finalize design around November of 2023. We'd start going out for bid for that work here um, over the course of December to April with an April construction start timeline. So Stephen, do you wanna address what would happen if, um, what the timeline would be like um, with a new, with, without the past vote in September? It's a bit of a tough, it's a bit of a tough question. Um, what I would say is, just for doing the work on the water plant. People have been working on this since a meeting back in 2018. So we're four years into what we're doing and we show another two or three years to get this plant done. Presuming that we could get started on the wastewater plant, you're looking at six, seven years maybe to get the wastewater plant upgraded and then another three or four years to then put the water plant in. So that's my best guess right now. Okay, thank you. Okay, do we have another comment? And, and while I'm waiting, I will say, you know, I, I apologize if I've missed your question here. I know I did miss a lot of questions as I was trying to combine things, but I will personally commit to going through this questions list and um, responding to those that um, we haven't gotten to yet. Um, and, you know, these are really helpful to us in knowing what kind of information we need to pull together to put on our website as well. Um, we just got another raised hand, uh, Abigail. So Abigail, I will ask you to unmute. Hi, uh, actually, Michael Gibson here at 142 Old Forge Road. Uh, just a couple quick comment questions. Um, and I'm happy the select board is on tonight. So, you know, hopefully these things can get addressed by our elected officials. And Sean, I guess this is kind of directed toward you uh, as the water superintendent, but it doesn't feel like the town is listening to a big concern from everyone in that 
the office and administration building really doesn't need to be there. And I understand, I mean, the family analogy was kind of cutesy, but you know, we just went through a global pandemic and I think everyone learned that you can kind of work from anywhere and we can even work remotely. And in 2022, you're telling me that some of the billing staff can't be at a different facility. We can't use email and phones to communicate with each other. Um, you know, I do have a follow-up after that, but I, I would love to hear that address right now of how in the modern age, you're telling me everyone has to physically be present when some of those individuals have absolutely nothing to do with the water treatment process itself. Well, first, um, thank you for, for the question. Um, I would never say it's impossible. Um, obviously, everything is, you know, everything is on the table. Everything is, is possible. Um, when you say the office administration has nothing to do with the operations, it's, it's almost exactly the opposite of that. Almost everything begins in the office in terms of work orders, um, appointments, scheduling appointments. Um, all of that stuff happens in the office and all of that has to be communicated either by myself or the foreman has to collect all those things and hand out all those work orders on a daily basis. Um, you also have attendance records. Um, you have when whenever any of the guys, um, you know, buy equipment or parts, you've got packing slips that have to go back. Um, there's, there's so many different things. There's overtime slips that are done on a daily basis. Um, I, my chief operator, Eric uh, Langland, I believe is, is on this call. He could uh, tell you from his perspective at being at the treatment plant, just how, um, how involved the office admin is with both treatment and distribution, if you, if you wanted to hear from him. Yeah, no, so Sean, I appreciate that, and right, so they're involved, definitely, they don't need to physically be there, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with tools like, um, you know, Workday, but that's kind of a common process that people uh, and companies utilize for human resource matters, like time cards and things like that, I mean, again, maybe the town just needs to think about updating to the 21st century, you know, well, a lot of these things, processing work orders, I mean, you're telling me you have to physically be there for that. We can't have an online system where those things are submitted and then signed off by the appropriate folks. I mean, does the town utilize email for any of this stuff? This is all this is all verbal by word of mouth. That seems crazy inefficient to me. Well, we are trying to work on it. I would encourage you to come down and tour our office. Um, I, it's got to be over 100 years old. Um, it's not handicap accessible. Um, it... Uh, it's it, it, it's we don't have caller ID. We have two phone lines, and if both lines are tied up like they were today, almost all day long, you'll get a busy signal. Um, so it, no matter what, the office admin and distribution need an upgrade. Um, Sean, I didn't mean to jump in um, sure. over you too, but I mean it, we should know. I mean, and this this is something that I learned too when I was touring it. Uh, and we forget too, we already do. I mean, when you send your bill in now, here, I just got my bill in on Geez, the background you can't see, but the billing is done at, uh, at Woburn Mass now, right? So when you send your water bill in, we are, we are using some of those uh, technologies and, and the ways to, to not have everyone there. When, when we're talking about admin, so many of these folks are engineers, they're doing the testing and other stuff. So I, I think it's a great idea to try and have um, you know, when we can, as you say, in this economy, having folks do stuff remotely, and, and we do. So, um, you know, I, I think what, what Sean's trying to get across too is that those folks in the admin, it's not, these are not just paper pushers um, that, that we're making sure that, you know, these folks are doing things critical to the chemicals and things that are there um, that really impact how the, the plant is operating, as opposed to just of uh, just some of the the other sort of work that we are trying to do in some cases north of Boston. Great, so Andrew, thank you. I, I wanna be uh, cognizant of everyone's time here. So I do have one more question. I would just, I'd love to get a, and maybe, you know, Sean uh, and everyone can follow up offline after this, a head count for the water department, everyone that works there, and then the individuals who are actually authorized to utilize chemicals 
and make any sort of changes to the water treatment plant facility because that really would impact what you're saying now is if everyone needs to physically be there or if you can't have two locations. And I completely agree with you. Let's upgrade everything. I think that's a great idea. No one's arguing that. They're just saying perhaps it doesn't need to be at the same location. So if someone could follow up uh, after with that, that would be fantastic. Uh, and my final question, and thank you everyone for giving me the time, uh, in the, the new site evaluation map, I know that for certain sites, not all sites, so perhaps it's kind of a rolling thing right now, pros and cons were listed. And it seemed to me that for a lot of other sites uh, that were available and had sufficient land usage, some of the cons were that it was located in a wildlife corridor and it had significant residential impact. Um, uh, I'll just note, you know, there was not a single pro or con that was added for the Stearns Meadow site. So in my mind, those two would be significant cons for this site. How, how is this site, how are there pros that outweigh all those other cons? If, if there's similar cons for everywhere, why is it this site in particular, right? So why aren't those cons being addressed for this site? Yeah, thank you for that question. I think that's a, that's a good one. Um, if, you know, we, we do want to look at all the sites the same way. So um, that's an update we can make to our interactive tool. Um, and then, you know, I can, I can toss it to the town to talk about this site specifically being selected. Um, or maybe that's a Stephen question. Andy, could I go back to the other questions? Kevin Caffrey, the DPW director. Sure, let me just note that we don't want to miss that one, so we'll come back to it. But go ahead, Kevin. So the, the question was, is, you know, do the two divisions need to be with each other? Um, distribution as well as treatment. We do a lot of cross training right now so that our distribution guys, some of them are working on their treatment licenses. One of our distribution guys now has been working in the plant to get his, um, his license so that he can do treatment. It takes a significant amount of time and people have to work in the two different areas in order to get a license. So for example, we could have distribution guys in working doing a cleaning project or a project in the treatment plant on a regular basis. So there's a lot of interaction with those guys and we try to cross train our guys so that we can do that. Um, and I just wanna point out, you know, Sean, a T4 license can take how many years for somebody to get? And the guys in the distribution department need that work as well as training and working in a facility so that they can continue getting their licenses. As I said, um, one of our distribution guys now, he, he only has a two, I believe, but he's working towards getting his three because we have a very hard time keeping um, level three and level four treatment operators. So it's, it's kind of critical that those guys work together. And I hope that helps answering the question. And um, I want to bring that up. Thanks, Kevin. And, and do you want to address the site selection? I think we remuted you. Yep, sorry, I'm going back to uh, unmute Stephen. He wants to address this one. Thank you. Katie, just reframe the question for me one time so I, I can be sure I'm answering the, the right question. So the question really was, I mean, there were two parts to it. One is that we didn't show complete information on our interactive map, so we can go back and address that. But I was hoping that you could speak a little bit to, you know, this site being selected and why. Yeah. So if I go back to the master plan uh, document that was prepared for the water plan after 2018 and the town-wide meeting that over 400 people attended. Um, in that plan, they identified the condition of the existing plant and the critical underperformance of the plant, the lack of reliability, et cetera, et cetera. At that time, that master plan specifically looked at what you might be able to fit on the existing site on presumptions about A, what treatment would work, and B, um, the availability to perhaps use the sewer further. Um, as that master plan was being finished and items in that master plan were being implemented like the upgrade of well 17A, which is now online with the manganese treatment facility. I think everybody on the team was looking at the 
difficulty of working with the existing site. Um, Stephen, I think I, the question, I, I'm sorry if I rephrase, if I didn't frame it correctly. The question is why was the Stearns Meadow site? So, no, so hi, I, I finally got unmuted again. That's, that's actually not the question. So my question is, of the other sites that you added data on the interactive map, you listed cons as a wildlife corridor and impact on residential neighbors. Those are the two biggest impacts on this site. One, where's the pro con list for this site? And two, if those are primary concern, not putting something in a different site, why do those concerns not matter for this site? So I don't think the intention here is that, a little bit different. I, I can answer this one, Katie. Um, so for the pro cons that we put up there, I believe that we had two cons um, for the Stearns Meadow site. We had proximity to residential neighbors and then high speed road fronted. So Chief Justice Highway having that 50 mile per hour speed limit um, was one of the cons for, for this site. Um, we did not include the wildlife corridor on this site particularly. Um, we went back and read the open space report that was um, presented or had that Town of Situate has on their website. And we looked at where those wildlife corridors are. And um, through that report, we did not see that this particular Stearns Meadow site did um, was in the middle of that corridor. That corridor instead, it appeared to have gone south of the Stearns Meadow site. Um, so other sites that we had on the um, evaluation did impact that corridor, but this particular site, because of all the residential houses behind it, that was already blocking the corridor. So this particular site is not part of that corridor. So that was why that con was not included for Stearns Meadow. And if the other cons were not posted on the website, that is our fault and we will make sure that they get updated. That, that might've been a mistake that they were missed. So I will check that after this meeting to make sure that those are included, but there should be proximity to residential neighbors is definitely a con for this site. Okay, uh, thank you very much for everyone's time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any hands. So I'm gonna go back to some of the questions that are in the chat um, and try to address some more of these questions um, along the way. Um, so let me, oh, I'm sorry, I just misscrolled. Um, there are some questions here about how much water is being used at Old Oaken Bucket. Um, I, I think that goes back to the capacity question. Um, so maybe that is something that we're not being clear about. Can we talk a little bit more about where the water, I mean, let's, let's go all the way back. Where's the, where's the water coming from? How much of it needs to be treated? What's the capacity that we think is necessary? And then how does this plant address that? So those are a lot of questions from me, <laughs> but I'm trying to consolidate um, some of what I'm seeing here in the chat. So maybe we can start with the Woodard and Kern team who's been working on some of the plant um, understanding to talk through, you know, knowing what you know about the town's, um, about the town's water use, water use sources, and then the existing and future needs. Can you talk about how this plan address, how the plan addresses those things? So I don't know if maybe Renee or Rob is able to chat on that. Rob, you're unmuted, so I'm gonna call okay. you. Sure, yeah, I wasn't sure if Renee wanted to go. Um, so this plan, the current plant that's there now, you know, was unable to you know, satisfy the demands of the town during the summer months. It's needed as a facility, you know, particularly during the higher demand yeah. season. Um, you know, to supplement the demand that's already been uh, supplied by the wells. And we talked about the manganese over there. I know the town yeah. has some uh, ongoing projects to reduce manganese from the well supply. So that's another piece of this puzzle. Um, the design of this new plan is going to allow the town to satisfy that summer demand um, up to, you know, the permitted capacity of that reservoir the way it currently stands. Um, you know, historically, they're, you know, they haven't been able to take advantage of that pond, you know, and, and the reservoir that feeds into it, you know, the supply demand during the high, you know, the high demand summer months, which really puts the town at risk. Um, and during the, the some master planning work that was done years ago, if the town is to lose the old oak and bucket facility during the summer months, you know, there will be more than severe water restrictions, you know, they might, you know, lose tank level. So every piece of this puzzle is, you know, really critical. And the new plant simply brings the capacity of that site of the of the reservoir system, you know, the, it brings the treatment capacity up to what the, the allowable withdrawal is of that uh, of that reservoir. 
We're not looking to expand the permitted withdrawal. We're just you know, seeking to activate uh, its usage during periods of high demand. I don't know if Renee wanted to add anything to that. Yeah, let's unmute Renee, please. Yeah, and I did just want to add to the fact of, you know, one of the things as part of this project, as we have mentioned, is looking at that reservoir um, and future intakes. And again, you know, that water up there is a bit available to be a little bit deeper um, than the Old Oaken Bucket. We know a lot of the challenges with Old Oaken Bucket Pond. Um, it's shallow, a lot of those issues that come with that water quality. So we are working through some of the piloting work at looking at the feasibility of that water. Um, but we do have challenges there with having somewhere to be able to put a raw water pump station to be able to take water from there. And, and that process and that timeline is much longer um, than starting the new facility with Old Oaken Bucket. Um, one of the the good parts about that is as we go through that and we're designing something to both of those water qualities, you have a very resilient facility that has uh, backups. So say a water main goes down or a pump goes down, a catastrophic failure, you have a backup plan. Um, so that is one thing I did just wanna note as far as uh, additional with water and where it's coming from on this. That is a little bit longer because of the permitting that does have to happen with any new source approval um, and some of the piloting and data collection. Um, but we have started some of that data collection and bench scale piloting to look at that work as we are moving forward with the others. Great, thank you. So um, I want to call on Stephen Young because he's messaging that his hand won't raise. And so I also just want to mention that if anyone, if you're having trouble raising your hand or if any for any reason it's not working, please say so in the chat and I will watch that so that we can call on you. So if we could unmute Stephen next, please. Yeah, thank you. Steve Young, 5 Old Forge Road. Um, I have a couple quick questions. Um, so uh, back at the uh, original vote to purchase this land, uh, Mr. Brujo, uh talked about uh, that it was uh, a $62 million, 500 and something thousand and 25 cent uh, plan to uh, keep the uh, f facility uh, on the uh, original site or near the original site. Where where is that um, plan, and um, why haven't we kind of looked at that and at least considered you know that plan? That was as little as as uh, I believe 2018 or 19. Um, you know uh, I understand it it was done. He had a very specific number, um, and it uh, it just doesn't seem feasible that somebody can um, have a plan out there and not even consider what that would look like. I'd like to see what that plan was and the footprint of it. Um, and I don't think it had lagoons. So at some point um, that was there, yeah. And then also um, the, another quick question for you is that, so you're saying, I think it's Rob Little, you were saying that the existing um, reservoirs wouldn't need to be expanded or touched. We would only, we would be, the, the 3 million gallons that you would like to pull from the reservoir and not use the wells, is that, um, where are you gonna get all this water to put through this, this water treatment plant? The uh, existing reservoirs, I believe, were told um, by the state that they wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't support the 3 million gallons. So I'm just wondering, are, are there any plans to expand the reservoir at some point? So, um, sorry, Stephen, I didn't interrupt you. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, because we, we currently get all our, our water from 90% of our water through the wells. Um, and I understand we're polluting, you know, where we have polluted Old Oak and Bucket for quite a while with a well. I don't know why that wasn't, um, looked at and thought about, but uh, you know, where are we gonna get all this extra water from? Um, we, we just during, during this summer, we, we run dry. So, you know, yeah. yeah, sorry, Bob. Um, when I was referring to running the service water treatment plant and resting the wells, that would be off season. That would be when mother nature has the reservoir spilling over naturally. 
So those would be in, in times of abundance of water. Sure. And it would also be in times of lower usage. Um, sure. No, I, I understand that. But um, I, I guess, you know, this land, right, because if I understand things correctly, is that the land, the proposed land, you know, Stearns Meadow, you know, it's surface water that fills, that runs into the uh, reservoir and the reservoir fills because of a, a lot of surface water. Surface water doesn't have manganese. Um, well water has manganese. We're, we're now building upon a piece of property that feeds the very thing that you're gonna draw from, right? So it, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it doesn't make sense to me. How, are you going to need to expand the reservoir at some point? I, I don't see a need to, and I'm sorry, I need to, to correct you that the surface water does have manganese in it. Um, it has less in it. Um, two years ago, when we went through this very similar uh, problem with the manganese spike in our um, old oak and bucket pond, I wanted to float a pipeline all the way to the res gate because of the water coming out of the reservoir gate uh, had about half the manganese that we were drawing sure. from Old Oak and Bucket Pond. Sure. Um, but I was told by a DEP that I would need a new source approval and I couldn't do that. Um, so, or I, I could be done, but it needed a new source approval and that's a multi-year process. So um, there is manganese in, in the surface water. Um, I think you touched a little bit of, upon plans for, you know, trying to re reuse or use the land at Old Oak and Bucket. I know I can speak for myself and my chief operator who has to log off right now, unfortunately, because he's got to shut the plant down. Um, but that that idea scares the, the heck out of us because we know how old that plant is and we know how frail it's become. So the idea of any heavy machinery being around our existing surface water treatment plant that if you'll remember three years ago, we did emergency repairs to it. Um, and some of those were structural repairs in our said basins. And we did a three to five year fix on it. We didn't do a 20 year fix. Uh, so we're running out of time on our existing surface water treatment. Sure. Plant. I, I fully understand that. And I think we all agree that we need a new water treatment plant. It, what we're trying to do is figure out how to lessen the footprint on, on this piece of property, right? Um, and I'm just trying to understand if we had a plan as little as 2018 or 19, why aren't we seeing that plan? That could be a backup plan. I, I don't understand why all options aren't on the table. And, and you know, if, if this does get voted down, um, you, you guys are, are, are wasting time. I mean, it's not, it's not any, anything else than that. You're wasting time. Why wouldn't you put all options on the table? I would like to address we're gonna let Renee that. answer that question and then I, I do we do have another raised hand so I want to make sure we're sure. we have yeah. time because okay. we're getting we're over time now. So if Renee you can answer this question and then we can please go to David. Yep. So I do want to address, you know, some of the stuff that you saw in the master plan and, and even earlier in the initial conversations that we've had on this facility were prior to piloting. Um, one big thing is you don't know until you start going through the chemistry and going through the process piloting. So there was a lot of assumptions in the master plan, as there always are with any planning document on, you know, it may be this if that. Um, one of the big things we found out during piloting is one of the technologies we were thinking might be using DAF, which could have a smaller footprint, was not feasible in this situation, um, which did create a larger facility. Also, you know, looking at the historical long-term um, manganese levels and going through that piloting and, and really seeing how we had to treat the water to be able to deal with that and get the water quality that met all the requirements. It, it really changes what the facility looks like. So, you know, we apologize, obviously, as time goes on and you have more information, you know, you're constantly iterating and, and changing what this looks like. But yes, at one point, it, you know, we thought, and I, you know, I think it was thought maybe it could fit on the existing facility or site, even with some of those constraints. 
But again, that was four years ago. We didn't have the information we have now. We've gone through three seasons of piloting. One thing we have seen is, you know, the additional residuals that are coming off with the additional filtration processes. So I did just want to acknowledge that, you know, with some of the additional information that we've gotten since July of last year, we got we did a piloting season in August, September. We did a piloting season um, in kind of end of January to March. And then we just recently finished a piloting season here in June. Thank you. So I apologize. I know we're over time. Um, I do want to let David make his comment or ask his question and then we will wrap up. So if we could, um, if we could please unmute David and then um, we'll finish up after that. Um. So very quickly, um, there's there's primarily three issues that I have questions on, and, and it's redundant, right? So we brought up the same issues. The admin area and the fact that all this administrative um, buildings need to be on the site, I, I think the town really needs to evaluate that. It should be pulled off site. I mean, we, we've stressed it. I know that it's convenience, but it can that can be moved. I think you need to really look at the these lagoons um, and how though you're basically putting ponds. It's not in my backyard, but it's not it's not fair to the, the abutters who are down in that area that you have gigantic open ponds. Steve Rafferty or Rob Little wouldn't want that pond in their backyard. So I really, you know, the town, they, they should look at that. That's unfair because it connects to the fact that the town has a wastewater treatment problem that they don't have capacity to deal with this. So it kind of segues into the wastewater treatment issue and and you know lastly um it, it, it's the, the fact that this wasn't shared prior to tonight that, it, that the fact that this building is this big um and this site you know that you're you're taking up so much space here it just really isn't you, you really didn't hear us when we were talking about it prior we've talked about the fact that this admin area needs to move to another location there really is no reason that it can't. So I think, you know, I really ask you to go back to the drawing board and scale this thing back. That that's that's what the abutters are asking for. I think if you guys were the abutters, you'd ask for the same thing. So I really ask you, I know you're only at 15% right now, right? So this is design development, but you should go back and, and really evaluate what should be on this site. What do you really need to put on this site? So that's what I asked for. Katie, so if you guys could look at that and, and take my input, I appreciate it. Thanks, David. We appreciate the comment. And I do want to reiterate, I'm sorry that you wanted to see this before and we didn't provide it for you, but I, I do want to reiterate that this will be available and tonight is not the end of the opportunity. So, you know, I, I would encourage you to take a look at this once we get it posted on the website um, and, and please provide us your additional comments. If we can go again to the... Um, the slide that has the email on it. I think um, generally people have this, but I want to make sure it's available. You can always email us, right? We, it, you can email us about the, the concept that you saw today. You can email us additional questions. You can continue to um, send us any feedback or input that you have. In fact, we're counting on it. I mean, what we've been doing here over the last few months has been trying to listen to some of the feedback that we've received and provide information that we have that's available. And I do know that at this time, we've not been able to answer all of your questions. That's just the truth of, of the situation. We're trying to provide you um, information as it does become available. So um, please continue to check back with us so that we can make sure that we are um, getting information in, of the hands who people, uh, the hands of those who want it. Um, you know, I, I started this meeting by saying that I was very encouraged by the attendance and I still feel that way. You know, at one point I looked down and we had 74 participants in this meeting. I think that's wonderful. You know, we're here to listen to you and talk to you and try to answer your questions and be responsive. So um, thank you for sharing with us and thank you for continuing to provide us with your comments and your questions. Um, we are over time, so I'm gonna wrap up. Um, again, you know how to reach us, please feel free to do so. If you're not signed up for our email list, please do that. Um, please visit the website periodically to see what we're putting up there. And we look forward to having continued conversations with you as we move through this process. We do need you, we need your input, and we appreciate your time. So thank you. We did include the link uh, to add yourself to that email list if you are not already on it uh, in the chat there. 
So if you put yourself on that, that is where we email uh, when we update things to the website. Thank you. And Stephen, I see you've asked when the next meeting or call will be. We haven't scheduled it yet, but we will be sending that information out in all of the public channels. Thank you all very much. Have a wonderful evening.